You have no doubt seen this iconic photo. It is the integration of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas on September 4th, 1957. The young woman screaming with that twisted, hateful look on her face is Hazel Bryan, who was a student at Little Rock High at the time and an anti-integration activist. The student being screamed at is Elizabeth Eckford, one of the Little Rock Nine who integrated the school under the protection of the National Guard. Well, here's a fun fact that anti-racism anti educator Tim Wise pointed out on his ex-Twitter account. This is a promo pic for the TV show Leave it to Beaver, a much beloved program, especially for white conservatives who view it as a nostalgic representation of family life and the ultimate example of a more innocent time. But here's the thing. Leave it to Beaver premiered on October 4th, 1957, one month to the day after that photo from Little Rock was taken, America was not innocent, and the evil wasn't only in the heart of Hazel Bryan or other Little Rock whites, it was a national sickness, one most whites ignored. CBS aired Leave It to Beaver about a quote-unquote typical American family and the mishaps of their youngest son, Theodore, a.k.a. the Beaver, as his older brother, Wally, and his typical suburban parents, Ward and June Cleaver, try to get him out of scrapes. And it debuted during a time of tremendous racial and gender upheaval in America. World War I and especially World War II had put a fire under millions of black Americans as black men came home from serving in Europe with newfound urgency to secure their rights here. The Korean War followed in 1950, prolonging the workforce disruption that had pushed many white women out of the kitchen and into jobs to replace their war fighting husbands. Meanwhile, the civil rights movement was winning epic court battles, culminating in Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, which ordered the integration of American schools. Meaning, white families faced the prospect of their kids going to school with black children, and many weren't happy about it. Hence the images of white moms and students screaming at black students as they entered all white schools. For affluent white women, the disruptions were stark. They watched their housemaids refuse to board the buses and come to work in Alabama for a whole year in 1955. Black women were often leaving domestic service altogether to also take industrial jobs during the wars or insisting on registering to vote. Many middle-class white women, meanwhile, particularly those who had gotten jobs during the war, found that they weren't exactly eager to go back to packing lunches and cleaning up after their husbands. So the fight was on to make them go back and give back the independence that earning their own money rather than relying on an allowance had produced. Post-war Hollywood enlisted itself in the project of reasserting normalcy in American society. TV shows portrayed happy housewives completely fulfilled by the task of keeping Little Beaver out of trouble and making sure Ward had his dinner on time. The folks at the Museum of Food and Culture write, quote, marketing efforts of the 1950s sold the idea of a happy housewife as one that is efficient, spends money wisely, makes food from scratch, always keeps the house clean, and make it all look effortless. Oh, and does all of this while looking gorgeous. And the promotion of this pristine domestic image and women who were fulfilled as housewives was pushed from all angles. Women's magazines featuring household products, the process of employment, the Mrs. Degree, the MRS, they called it, banking rules, assumptions and judgments, television shows like Leave it to Beaver, the Donna Reed Show, Ozzy and Harriet, and more. But change was coming, whether the men of Hollywood, Madison Avenue, and Main Street liked it or not. All the Tupperware parties, kitchen gadget, and girdle commercials in the world weren't going to stop women who wanted their own money, meaningful work, or access to birth control which came via a Supreme Court decision in 1972, the right to abortion, which came via Roe v. Wade in 1973, and women right to open a bank account without a man's signature, which women couldn't do until 1974. And here's something I didn't mention at the top. Leave it to Beaver, that emblematic archetype of the 1950s, actually wasn't a hit at the time. It never cracked the top 30 TV programs throughout its initial TV run and only became popular as a cult classic rerun in the 1980s when it was more of a parody of the 1950s than an aspirational show. The top shows in the actual 1950s included the George Burns and Gracie Allen show, which showed a married couple who were bickery equals, and I Love Lucy, which portrayed another real-life marriage between a feisty comedian, Lucille Ball, 
and a Latino actor named Desi Arnaz. These shows were indeed about housewives, but disruptive rather than blissful ones. The changes in what women expected from the world, it turns out, were irreversible. But getting women back under control, particularly white women, has been the project of the dominant economic class since the 1950s. And it accelerated during the 1970s, when an impressive woman named Phyllis Schlafly led the conservative cause of convincing women that what they really wanted wasn't freedom, independence, or feminism, or God forbid, an equal rights amendment to the Constitution. No, no. It was good old-fashioned domesticity. Katie Britt is in the Phyllis Schlafly tradition, an Alabama lawyer and United States senator who would have you believe that she's nothing more than a happy housewife, much like Schlafly was an author and powerful public speaker who would have had you believe the same. The goal? To sell women on giving up their hard-won rights and freedoms so that the men can be back in charge. Their vehicle? It's called the trad wife trend. My guests and I will explain what that is after the break. I am a proud wife and mom of two school-aged kids. I'm worried about their future and the future of children in every corner of our nation. And that's why I invited you into our home tonight. That was Alabama Senator Katie Britt, a lawyer and former chief of staff to her Senate predecessor, talking of her qualifications in last week's Republican response to the president's State of the Union address. Or, as her Alabama colleague Tommy Tuberville put it, she was picked as a housewife, not just as a senator. Joining me now is Molly Jongfast, Vanity Fair special correspondent and MSNBC contributor, and Olivia Troy, former senior advisor to Vice President Mike Pence and executive director of the gun safety group 97%. Thank you both for being here. Olivia, I do want to go to you first, because you are a conservative. I don't know if you're still in the party, but you came from the Republican Party initially. What did you make of it? Because a lot of Republicans hated it. A lot of Republicans gave it very bad reviews. What did you make of her presentation? I was horrified. I mean, I sat there in shock. First of all, I mean, you couldn't uh, ignore the kitchen setting. And I kept thinking, this is how they're going to court women. They already have a problem with women in the Republican Party. And you choose to put a female senator in the kitchen to deliver probably the most important speech she's giving of her career to date, right? And so I thought it was ridiculous. I also thought it was a slap in the face to conservative women. I mean, I just thought it was, they made a mockery out of her, that they chose this rising star, as she's been called in the GOP. She was well-respected. And instead, this thing was a ridiculously breezy, whatever the heck that was in her tone <laughs> and the way she kind of spoke through it. Well, she wore a cross, but yet her shirt, her shirt yeah. was unbuttoned. I mean, it was it was tragic on so many ways and and so insulting. Honestly, Joy, I just sat there yeah. in disbelief. It, it, there was so much about it as I was watching it, uh, Molly. It, it was giving you know Serena Joy Green blouse. It was giving very mm -hmm. dramatic, and also just the fact that she actually was one of the people who negotiated the very conservative immigration bill that got tanked. She and Langford worked on that together. She actually has an accomplishment she could have talked about. She didn't. Um, but what she did show us, I think, and I would love for you to explain this a little bit, because you're in, you're, you know what the youngins are, are doing out there on the socials. To me, she was giving the trad wife trend, which I'm not sure if people are familiar with it, but if you could explain what that is, because that to me is what she was trying to give. Well, so this is the idea that you being, it's housewifery in this this current century. It's the idea that you're a mother and that you do things, but it, it's sort of exaggerated. Like you do things like you grind your own flour and you make your own bread and you homeschool your kids. And you, I mean, it's very kind of exaggerated. And the idea here is to push women into the kitchen, right? And what I think is so interesting about watching her was that you really saw... Policy-wise, it's very hard to defend a lot of this stuff, right? Like, you've got yeah. Republicans, you know, abortion. You've got women who are, you know, having miscarriages being sent to parking lots to wait until they're sick enough to get treatment. You have, you know, states trying to ban IUDs and the morning after pill and saying they're going to come after birth control. So it's very hard as a woman to defend these policies. And so you yeah. find her, such, you know, telling a sex trafficking story about something that happened in Mexico during the Bush administration. 
Well, and her beliefs on abortion means that if that same story happened today, she would expect if that victim got pregnant, she would expect them to give birth. And she gave that horrible mm -hmm. story. And I wanted to yell through the TV. Yes, ma'am. That's why people want to have a rape and incest exception, exception at minimum, because if a 12 year old had that happen to them, Katie Britt would say, you got to have the baby. Um, let, let me mm -hmm. let me uh, play one more thing, because there's another person, Olivia, who's doing this game, too, of trying to attract women in weird ways. Here's Nancy Mace defending her support for Donald Trump to George Stephanopoulos. You're trying to shame me this morning. I'm just asking And I find it offensive, and this is why women won't come forward. Women won't come forward because they're defamed by those who perpetrate rape. Donald Trump they are been... judged and they're shamed, and you're trying to shame me this morning. I'm, I'm I think not, it's disgusting. I'm not shaming you at all. I, I told you my courageous. story. It took me 25 years to tell my story. I was judged for it. I still get judged for it today. I'm asking you a very simple question. It, and I answered Explain it. You're why, shaming no, me for I'm my not, political I'm not, choices. I'm asking you a question about why you endorse someone who's been found liable for rape. Just it was not a criminal court. Olivia, I mean, Nancy Mace has actually wow. been very brave in talking about being a rape survivor. Mm -hmm. The idea that she is now having to walk the plank for Trump, who has 26 some odd accusers and who is now an adjudicated sexual abuser at minimum, is to me offensive that the Republican Party would even make her walk that plank. And yet she is there. She is walking it willingly. Yeah. And even more appalling that she would walk it willingly, like you said. I mean, that is what is so uh, outrageous here is the fact that it has taken her this long and she has spoken out with courage on this issue. And then she caves only to support Donald Trump. That's that's the bottom line here. That's why she's walking it back. And so what is the definition here? So is it, you know, you, rape is horrible. It's awful. It should never be condoned, right? I mean, we should be standing against it unless it's uh, candidate that I have to support because I'm in the Republican Party, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to walk it back, and then I'm going to try to flip the narrative on George Stephanopoulos, who's seriously just asking very factual <laughs> questions and trying to understand her reasoning. So explain it to us then, Nancy Meese. Explain it to everyone across the country. Explain it to American women. Explain to us your stand, because I don't yeah. understand it. I, I Quite frankly, I think it's so infuriating to watch and to double down on it, which is what she's done, right? She That's what she's been yeah. doing on social media. She has been doubling down on the fact and, and trying to spin the tables on George, saying that he was offensive, yeah. that he's shaming her. Well, no, you're, you're shaming actually all women by the fact that you were walking back all of the history of you standing up for Donald yeah. Trump. Molly, she said the word, you're shaming me 22 times. She said offensive 13 times. He was asking a very obvious and logical question. She's trying to now shame her. But I, the last thing I'm going to give you, Molly, she then turned around and shamed E. Jean Carroll and sort of mocked mm -hmm. her response yeah. and her survival. So this is how you're selling women on voting Republican? I don't see it. I don't get it. Yeah. No, I mean, they have, you know, they're in a very tough position, right? Because they have to defend yeah. the misogynistic policies and then they have to defend yeah. the president, you know, the president with all the allegations. Uh, indeed, the candidate yeah, and with all the allegations. Time. Indeed. Molly John Fast, Molly John Fast, Olivia Troy, thank you both very much. But we begin tonight with a big lie. No, not the big lie. Another lie. Something that we heard in Senator Katie Britt's response to President Biden's State of the Union address last week. Now, you remember, during the Alabama senator's rather odd remarks, there was this moment when things got really, really dark. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. This is the United States of America, and it is past time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. Now, while she does not explicitly say when and where these horrific events took place, it is heavily implied that it happened on President Biden's watch, which turns out not to be the case at all. As journalist Jonathan Katz uncovered this weekend, not only did these atrocities take place in Mexico and not in the United States. They happened between 2004 and 2008 when the American president was George W. Bush. 
The victim in this story, Carla Jacinto Romero, even spoke out after Brit's lies were exposed, telling CNN, quote, I hardly ever cooperate with politicians because it seems to me that they only want an image. They only want a photo. And that, to me, is not fair, unquote. But beyond just misleading the public on that story, something else Senator Britt also forgot to mention is her own party's role in blocking immigration-related legislation over the past several decades. Now, I'm old enough to remember when comprehensive immigration reform was actually a very normy Republican policy goal in the Ronald Reagan, George Herbert Walker Bush era. In fact, in November 1986, my freshman year in college, President Reagan signed into law the Bipartisan Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, better known as the Simpson-Mazzoli Act, named for a Democratic congressman, Romano Mazzoli of Kentucky, and Republican Senator Alan Simpson of Wyoming, a bill that granted literal and immediate amnesty to any immigrant who had arrived in the U.S. prior to January 1st, 1982, some two million people while making it illegal to knowingly hire undocumented migrants going forward. That was an acceptable and normal Republican position in 1986. But ever since then, there has been a right-wing war on immigration reform, driven not by Republican politicians, but rather by another thing that came out of the 1980s, besides lifestyles of the rich and famous and Donald Trump. Right-wing talk radio, led by its biggest star, Rush Limbaugh, whose nationally syndicated show first aired two years before the Simpson-Mazzoli bill in 1984. And when Fox News, Roger Ailes' right-wing propaganda operation, joined the fray in 1996, the incentive structure of the Republican Party, it just fundamentally changed. By 2007, the George W. Bush administration and a bipartisan group of senators reached a deal on an immigration bill that would have created a path to citizenship for the millions of post-1986 undocumented immigrants living in America, as well as a new temporary worker program and stricter border security. Many thought that this would be the big legislative achievement of Bush's presidency until this happened. We heard that there was a bipartisan consensus on immigration. It was bipartisan and and it, it was all good. President Bush was signing on and Republicans, John Kyle, and we had Ted Kennedy was happy. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> it had been left up to the major news networks or the, you know, regular cable networks. This would have been a done deal. This was, uh, this was signed, sealed, and delivered right at the Rio Grande for us. Well, it turned out that talk radio and the Internet energized the people. Right-wing cable, TV, and radio hosts like Laura Ingraham, as well as Lou Dobbs, Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, and especially Rush Limbaugh, trashed the bill nonstop, blanketing the airwaves and rallying their largely white male conservative audiences against the bill. Until hardliners in Congress, who were also likely hardcore consumers of right-wing media themselves alongside their voters, killed it entirely. Almost the same thing happened six years later when President Obama was in office. That is when the Gang of Eight was formed, a bipartisan group of senators who came together to finally get immigration reform done. The group included big names in the Republican Party, like John McCain, Lindsey Graham, and was led by Marco Rubio, a Cuban-American and the party's new Tea Party star. The Latino Obama, the media crowed, hyping him up as Republicans' potential first Latino president. The New York Times reported that as part of the sales pitch, Rubio went on Limbaugh's show to try to sell him on the bill. And Rubio, along with Senator Chuck Schumer, went so far as to meet with Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes to try to persuade them to keep Fox's on-air personalities from savaging the legislation and just give it a fighting chance at survival. But apparently they were unsuccessful, as that is exactly what wound up happening. Several conservative media figures even signed on to a letter opposing this bill. And once again, it died in Congress. Fast forward to today. And we shouldn't be surprised that yet another bipartisan border bill was killed by D.C. Republicans, including the aforementioned Alabama Senator Katie Britt, who, like Rudio, was part of the team that negotiated the very conservative immigration bill that House Speaker Mike Johnson is now refusing to bring to the floor, all because the new Rush Limbaugh, Donald Trump, told them he wants to run on the issue instead of letting his party solve it. 